Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to CPA Canada's webinar on rebuilding the Canadian economy. My name is Francis Fong, and I'm Chief Economist at CPA Canada, and uh, I'll be your moderator today. Our session over the next hour is going to be a deep dive into the issues facing Canada's economy as we enter this fledgling recovery, with a discussion on what the Canadian co government ought to do to support it. In addition to bringing you what I expect to be a lively discussion, the goal of this event is to hear from you, our members. We want your ideas and thoughts on what measures government can implement toward a sustainable recovery and economy. Your views will help shape the commentary CPA Canada will be making during the pre-budget consultation process towards the next federal budget. Before we get to the presentation itself, uh, a few housekeeping items. This webinar is being simultaneously interpreted in French. If you click the interpretation button in the toolbar, you can choose French uh, to hear the interpreter speak. To participate in this discussion, please use the Q&A box in the toolbar. If you click it, it will bring up a window where you can type in your questions and comments. Later in the session, our expert panelists and I will be answering your questions, so please feel free to submit them at any time. If anything we discuss brings up any ideas, please do submit them. In addition, please use the same Q&A box to submit any ideas on what the government could do to help. We will collect all the input we receive in the Q&A section from the session. If we could uh, move on to the next slide, please. This live session is also just one opportunity to be part of an ongoing dialogue. We also invite you and other members to join the conversation on our digital engagement platform. You can submit your ideas here too on how to rebuild Canada's economy. If we can move on to the next slide, uh, let's move on to the introductions. Our panelists today are myself, Linda Nazareth, economist, host of the podcast, Work in the Future, and a senior fellow at the McDonald Laurier Institute, and Trevin Stratton, chief economist and vice president of policy at the Canadian Chamber of Commerce. First off, let me thank both of our panelists for taking the time to, att uh, to attend and uh, lend their expertise to this important topic. If we could move on to the next slide, uh, as for how the event will progress today, we'll be starting off with brief opening remarks from the three of us, uh, followed by a discussion where I'll ask questions of our panelists before moving on to an open Q&A session where we'll be answering questions that you have sent via the Q&A box. We also invite you to participate in two short polls. The first one will come up after our brief remarks and the second one will come up after our panelists moderated discussion just before we move on to the open Q&A. Now uh, perhaps I'll, I'll move on to the uh, opening remarks. This recession has been unlike any other in history. Business shutdowns as a result of health policies designed to stop the spread of COVID-19 while absolutely necessary have caused the most significant decline in both economic activity and jobs in history. In total, the decline in GDP is expected to be almost three times as large as in 2008, 2009, which at the time, if you recall, was thought to be a one in 100 year shock. Meanwhile, job losses over just March and April alone were seven times as large as those in the entirety of the last recession. But unlike previous recessions related to the rise and fall of the business cycle, this was a policy-driven recession, the impacts of which were disproportionate across sectors and people. Two of the three million jobs lost to the pandemic occurred among low-wage, low-skilled occupations. And while some industries such as finance or the real estate sector saw only small declines in economic output, others such as accommodation and food or the recreation sector have fallen by as much as 40%. No sector has been left unscathed, but neither has the pain been evenly felt. This economic recovery will be equally unprecedented and replete with challenges. Such a steep decline in economic activity would have taken several years to climb out of, even in a best case scenario. However, the fact that the provinces are implementing these phased approaches to reop reopening, rightly so in order to prevent additional waves of infections from arising, 
combined with the continued physical distancing policies that will likely remain in place, suggests that this recovery will be very elongated. And time is a factor here. The longer the economy operates at a lower level of output, the more economic scarring is likely to take place. The recession is ostensibly over. In just the last two months, Canada has already added back 40% of the jobs lost. But economic recovery does not mean there is no longer economic pain. Businesses that may have survived the last six months may not survive the coming six months at that reduced level of cash flow, whatever reduction they may be seeing. Some of those businesses that have already fallen or will fall in the coming months may not come back, leading to a permanent loss in both economic output and jobs. On top of that, uncertainty remains high due to a multitude of domestic and international factors. Chief among them is the outlook for the US where coronavirus cases are surging in some of the largest states, including Arizona, Florida, Texas, and California. New cases are emerging at a rate above 60,000 per day. Compare that with the roughly 110,000 cases Canada has had in total. This poses the obvious risk that Canada imports additional cases of the virus, but also to the economic outlook if additional shutdowns occur in our largest trading partner. The border to our south is not the only issue either. Canada has long depended on immigration flows as a tool to address skilled labor needs. With international travel as restricted as it is, Canada has seen a dramatic decline in newcomers. Permanent resident admissions between March and May, for example, were one third of what they were last year. Our economy may be reopening soon, but government will likely be more cautious with the border, potentially putting some businesses' skilled labor needs at risk. And let's not forget that there were plenty of issues Canada was dealing with prior to the pandemic that, were, that are still important low productivity growth and broad competitiveness concerns, climate change and how Canada is going to navigate a transition to a low carbon economy, the impact of AI and automation on jobs and skill demands, supporting the growth of the digital economy, just to name a few. Yet, despite all of the doom and gloom, and with the monumental task ahead for governments trying to figure out the ways to support the recovery, we may be in the best position yet to address all of these broad concerns. Why? Because we are all now asking the same question. What's next? How do we get out of this? How do we set ourselves up for the future? So perhaps with that, I'll uh, pass it to Linda Nazareth, uh, and I'll ask that she unmute herself before moving on to her opening remarks. Thanks very much, Francis. You know, as much as these are crisis times, I also think we're in exciting times. We are absolutely breaking the model and coming up with something brand new. I'm not sure we would have done it in the same way and at the same speed had it not been for this pandemic. So maybe the silver lining is we'll find better ways to do things. Where I focus most is on the future of work. And what I'm seeing there is we had trends that were really in place before this started. We are not going to escape those. And we're also adding some layers to it. Now, what do I mean by before we started all the, with the pandemic? Well, demographics was already changing the landscape. We had huge retirements coming. We had new generations coming into the workforce. We were dealing with integrating all of that not entirely successfully and I think we'll have some extra questions after this because a lot of people's financial stability has been really put under strain and will we have people staying in the labor force longer? Uh, will we have younger people resentful of not being able to get a foothold? Those are things we have to come to grips with. As well, the fourth industrial revolution absolutely in full force right now. We are looking at automation taking over all industries at really increasing speeds. It was going to be a question mark for jobs anyway. A lot of job functions, maybe as much as 20 or 30 percent of job functions, maybe more, were going to be things that machines could do. Now with companies trying to deal in this new economy, something of a recessionary environment coming out of this, will they automate more quickly or will they hesitate? I think over the long run, we are still looking at the same questions. We just have to deal with the speed of it. Then there is the fact that we will be coming out of this in 2021 in something of a recession. 
whether it is technically or not, the fact is companies will have been under strain. They will make really difficult decisions on jobs. And we may be in kind of the old fashioned layoff situation just because of where the business cycle is, not even to mention all the bankruptcies and closures that, that will have happened. But you know, again, I do think it's a, an interesting and perhaps uh, a time that will give us some silver linings. We need a reskilling revolution arguably in this country and in many countries. We need to retrain people. We need to create the, the right skills. Some of the private sector had said they were gonna do that before this all started, particularly in the US, we heard from Amazon and Disney, other large companies saying, you know, they were putting in large scale plans. Will we see more of this? Should we see more of this? Who should pay for it if we do? Should it be all the private sector? Should there be more individual responsibility? Should the government come in in a really big way? What kind of partnerships can we have? Uh, how will this change our communities? Will we have some people who are not able to participate? Do we have to talk about something like what we had with the CRB, some kind of income support over a longer term? And if we do that, what are the social costs of that? And, you know, even longer term, what kind of society do we want to have? And can we start doing things now to get us there? As I say, there's many, many challenges ahead. Uh, but I'm actually fairly hopeful because this is the time we make the right decisions. And at least we're starting the conversation. Thanks, Linda. Why don't we uh, pass it to Trevin? Yeah, thanks, Francis. And um, the way that I look at it is that we've entered almost a new phase of, uh, of the impact of COVID on the economy. Um, and looking forward, when we're looking at recovery, there are certain factors that we haven't yet even come, come to terms with just yet. Um, so I mean, looking backwards, certainly the focus was on providing things like liquidity supports for businesses to maintain the connection between employers and employees. Um, obviously, uh, you know, some of the programs that were created with CERB or, or even with uh, the emergency business account to provide liquidity. Now I think we've entered a, a second phase of reopening uh, where you know, a number of provinces have entered uh, you know, second or third phases of their reopening. Uh, and we're in this process where we're starting to transition away from subsidies uh, more towards growth-led policies. And we saw that with the announcement on Friday uh, with, with the uh, ramping of the wage subsidy. Um, and similarly, we might be looking at something happening with, with CERB going forward as well. So it stops creating distortions in the labor market. But then looking ahead, I think there are some really big picture uh, issues that we're gonna have to deal with to actually get our economy back up and running uh, because the solution to getting out of this is going to be growth uh, and getting back to economic growth. Uh, and so I, um, I definitely agree with, with what Linda said um, that you know, certainly one of our priorities has to be getting Canadians back to work. Uh, and what's gonna be very important in that uh, is definitely reskilling and upskilling and retraining programs. Um, and so I don't necessarily wanna to, want to rehash what Linda said, um, but moving on to kind of the second area, um, I think it's going to be getting supply chains moving again. Uh, you know, this has been a demand crisis in some ways um, with a number of individuals losing their jobs. We went from one of the tightest labor markets in Canadian history to three million job losses in the span of six weeks. Um, but we haven't necessarily had a focus on the supply impact of the crisis as well. Uh, you know, getting Canadian businesses up and running after a prolonged shutdown is going to be extremely challenging. Uh, the rollout of essential services rules across the country has created this patchwork that prevents the continuation of many of the critical functions of businesses um, and that their customers require. Um, and also most industries are going to need to reactivate their entire supply chain, uh, where the weakest point in the chain is gonna determine the success of a return to economic activity. Um, and so we've been talking about these competitive aspects before, um, you know, things like regulatory gridlock, things like trade enabling infrastructure, um, but these are actually gonna become more and more important or that um, the importance of them has been accelerated by the pandemic itself. Um, secondly, uh, is managing debt and deficits. You know, I mentioned a lot of, sorry, thirdly, uh, is managing debt and deficits. And, you know, I mentioned a number of those support programs that were put, put, put in place. Um, you know, we've seen the, the price tags attached to them over recent weeks. We're looking at a, a $350 billion deficit. We're looking at um, a national debt of, of over a trillion dollars federally and including the provinces, you know, we're, we're probably looking at, at $2 trillion, which is, uh, which is 100% of our GDP. Right. Um, and so uh, figuring out how to find, walk that fiscal tightrope um, between reducing debt and deficits, but also maintaining a competitive tax system that encourages business investment and economic growth is going to be instrumental going forward for Canada, but also for, for every other country that's dealing with this too. 
Uh, fourth, I think that um, we're going to have to deal with navigating global fragmentation. We're seeing a reversal of decades of economic globalization um, and international supply chains um, that's going to create challenges for a trading nation like Canada. Right? Uh, international trade patterns and global capital flows are going to shift as the pandemic disrupts the global economy. Um, and we're already starting to see that uh, with some moves towards nearshoring and onshoring. Um, and so as the pull of protectionist policies grow, as countries start to look inward to recover from COVID-19, um, uh, the barriers erected are going to be slow to come down. Um, and so a, a Canadian com a, a, in Canada, you know, a country where we rely quite a bit on, um, on international trade, where we rely quite a bit on, uh, on immigration and international students, um, this is going to have a significant impact. Um, certainly, you know, the, this very webinar itself, um, but the pandemic has uh, changed how we live, how we work, um, and how we use technology. Uh, a crisis of this scale is undoubtedly going to alter consumer preferences and workplace norms. Canadians have suddenly become forced to work remotely, uh, conducting virtual meetings, adopting online shopping and e-learning on a massive scale. Uh, and so an increasingly digital economy is also going to require major investments in things like sophisticated networks, cybersecurity, and electronics. Uh, and Francis, I know you touched upon um, a resilient resource sector, um, and this is going to be very important for Canada going forward. Many Canadian resource companies find themselves in uncharted territory right now. Um, the demand destruction from COVID-19 measures has caused oil prices to plunge at the beginning of the crisis um, and created significant declines in global demand for other natural resources like metals, forest products, et cetera. Um, and so as we look forward, you know, with the right supports, Canada can gain market share by innovating to create less emission intensive oil and gas products, um, also providing billions in urgently needed government revenues and driving investments in renewable and clean technologies. Um, but we're going to need to figure out what is the path forward uh, in order to do that um, and to ensure that our resource sector remains resilient. Something that um, has specifically, that we've specifically heard at, uh, at the Canadian Chamber of Commerce is that small businesses, SMEs, are really on the front line of the economic side of the crisis. Um, and emergencies like pandemics, natural disasters, future cyber attacks are, pose unique challenges for SMEs. Um, and they're going to need uh, targeted supports um, in the event of future crises for them to survive. Um, you know, substantial tools, resources to help them maintain operations and adapt to a different economy. Uh, and then something that's, that's, you know, not often talked about when we talk about economic recovery, but is going to be a very important aspect um, is strengthening our public health infrastructure. Um, you know, public health and, and healthcare systems are going to become an even greater competitive advantage for nations as, as we look forward. Um, and governments are going to need to rethink the speed and agility with which they need to react to make public health decisions and provide financial support to individuals and businesses. Um, and similarly, we're probably going to see a renewed look at the importance of vaccines and things like clinical trials uh, taking place within Canada and ensuring that they, that they remain to take place in Canada going forward. Um, and then finally, you know, I think um, we're going to need to rethink government's roles and priorities. Um, you know, the needs of society and the tools that are used to meet them may be profoundly different uh, going forward. Um, and so certainly looking at the role of government in society, but also looking at how do we innovate government itself so that it's able to act in a more agile, more flexible way, um, and maybe even using technologies for government services in a greater way going forward too. Uh, there's gonna to be a big push for that, and it's gonna be very important. Um, and so maybe I'll leave it at that, Francis, and then you can move to, to the next part of the agenda. I love that idea of uh, public health infrastructure as a competitive advantage. I think that's really fresh. Um, so uh, thanks both for, for some really insightful remarks. Um, perhaps before we move on to the, to the, to, to the broader discussion, uh, we'll start with our first poll question. If I could ask our moderator or other moderator to throw up the first poll question. So in the year ahead, what will be the greatest challenge faced by businesses? And uh, you can see the list of options before you. So uh, we'll give you a minute to, to answer here. Uh, in the meantime, just while our members are, are thinking that through, I would love both of our panelists to weigh in on this. Um, Trevin, you mentioned uh, uh, you know, some unique vulnerabilities with respect to SMEs. What do you think from their perspective, just kind of kicking it off, from their perspective, what do you think they would pick in this regard? Uh, I think one of two, depending on what sector they're in. Um, and so uh, definitely liquidity, 
um, is still something we're seeing in some of the hardest hit sectors, uh, particularly uh, in the food services sector and tourism uh, in, in retail to a certain extent and accommodation definitely. Um, and that's definitely going to be a, a concern going forward as well. Um, but I think a, a larger concern that impacts all sectors um, is definitely uncertainty. Uh, is that particularly for SMEs, it's hard to do business planning. Um, it's hard to figure out what to invest in. It's hard to, to understand how many people you're gonna be able to bring back to work um, if you are uncertain about um, what supports are gonna be in place, whether you're eligible for them, how long they're gonna last. Um, and also unsure about even larger questions like whether there will be a second wave or when will a vaccine be created. Uh, and so that's, um, you know, I, I, I would go with those two. Yeah, Linda, your thoughts? I agree. Uncertainty is definitely the short-term challenge. You know, we know we do economic forecasts. We get them wrong sometimes, but we usually have decent parameters. We can say, well, you know, after the election, this will happen, and we know this many people will come into labor force next year, whatever. This time, we really have no clarity. We can't say when things will open up. We can't say when there'll be flights again. You know, it's very, very hard to do any kind of strategic plan like that, even one with different scenarios. But you know, I think the bigger thing, longer term, is really pivoting the business because we're not coming back into the same economy we had going into this. Lots of people will not be going back to the office. We will have to reconfigure offices if they do, even beyond the pandemic. I don't think we'll operate exactly the same way. But you know, we've realized there's other business models that work. And a lot of companies will have shifted their technology between now and then, or, or they'll be thinking about it. Yeah. So it's really like sort of sitting down and saying, wow, how can I survive this phase? And then how can I best operate when we're done? And yeah, that's, that's a pivot they didn't expect. Absolutely. Yeah. So maybe we can close the poll and see what the results were. Uncertainty, unsurprising. I think that for me, I think it, it it kind of all starts there. Like if you're talking about uh, where I'm headed for the for the for the for the year ahead, it all starts with well, you know, when when does the full reopen happen? When does the border reopen? What what is physical distancing policy is going to look like? There's so many of those policies that have yet to be really solidified. So and it all starts here. So I, I think this is perhaps a little bit unsurprising. Uh, let's move on to the first kind of question that I have uh, for Linda. I think um, in light of the pandemic. You know, you've you've talked a lot about skills and uh, and and you know, in your experiences as, as talking about the future of work. How, based on how the pandemic has unfolded and who has been impacted, how has your perspective on the broader skills conversation changed, if if at all? Now, that's a good question. I don't know if it really has changed for the long term. You know, right now it's easier to say, well, you know what, it was more marginal workers, it was students, and it was people who were working part time. But we're pretty early into this. If this doesn't turn around quickly, we're going to be looking at deeper layoffs and yeah. much harsher realities. And that will, I think, intensify this debate we have over you know, which skills are we going to need for the long term, and which people really are the ones that are expendable. And the other thing I have, and I haven't seen a lot of data yet, is how quickly are companies moving to automation? I'll give an example. We talk about grocery store workers as being heroes and frontline workers, and they absolutely are. But I wonder how quickly these stores that value them are bringing in robots that can do a lot of these things. It will yeah. be safer in one sense, uh, but it will also displace a ton of workers. So I think for me, this pandemic may move us towards automation more quickly. Yeah, and I, that, that will intensify that debate on skills. Yeah, I think, you know, given w what's been going on, like we've, we've perhaps lost a little bit of visibility as to the speed at which technology has continued to accelerate because we've all been kind of focusing on, on just surviving the pandemic. So, and certainly this this pandemic could very well be that trigger, I think, because it's kind of the important point. In a recent op-ed, you wrote about the World Economic Forum calling for a quote-unquote reskilling revolution, but that at the time, and this was a few months ago before, before uh, we all went into isolation, no one was really in a hurry to action that. You asked, will the pandemic mean it gets put off further or will it accelerate it? I'd like to flip that around and ask, should the, should the revolution get put off further or should it accelerate it, given where we've seen the impacts? Well, I think it should accelerate it, obviously. And, you know, I think some countries have done okay at this. Uh, I take the example of Sweden. They realized that they needed more help in hospitals, and they also had grounded all their flights. So what they did is they had a program to retrain flight attendants who had some training in nursing and 
medical things already, to go in the hospitals and be nurses' assistants. They also had another program to take uh, unemployed workers from airlines and other places to go into schools so that teachers could be off if they were sick and somebody could be in the classroom. And you could also have other support in the schools. So we haven't done that here in Canada, uh, mm -hmm. that kind of reskilling. Maybe we need to think about that. Yeah, that's a good point. So Trevin, maybe I'll open this next question up to you. Uh, you know, over the years, we've heard much about how businesses need to go digital, but the pandemic really made it real. Like you already talked about the rise of e-commerce and, and e-learning uh, as kind of being the primary source of, of, of how people do things now. Um, so we've had to adopt new technologies to communicate and conduct business. Um, uh, you're working from home, et cetera. How do you think the pandemic has changed our conversation about the transition to the digital economy? And specifically, what does government need to do need to, do to continue to facilitate that? Yeah, you know, I'm, um, I'm an economist, but I, I'm a student of economic history, and I, that's what I, I wrote my, my, my thesis on when, when I was back doing my PhD, um, looking at the Great Depression. Uh, and, you know, I think we're certainly, there are certain periods in history that are inflection points for the economy where, where everything changes, like during the Great Depression, where we saw a reversal of globalization. At the same time, we saw a shift from agricultural economies towards industrial economies and creating government apparatuses for that. Um, and, you know, I think we're probably going through something similar here right now um, when it comes to digital innovation and the digital economy. Um, and, uh, you know, certainly I, I think a number of businesses have realized the value of it. What's going to be important and maybe what, how it has changed the conversation as opposed to how we previously talked about it, um, it's that we, we are not, we can't move away from, you know, old economy sectors to new economy sectors. What we need to do is digitize all sectors of the economy or figure out what are the opportunities to do that, right? Like tech isn't a sector, it's a horizontal that cuts across sector verticals. Um, and, you know, I, I think that's going to be very important when it comes to government priorities going forward too. Um, is not necessarily picking and choosing winners and losers, um, but determining you know what can happen within each sector um, to move towards this this new type of economy that we're all probably moving towards. Um, and that's also going to be very important in terms of ensuring that there aren't businesses, that there aren't sectors, that there aren't regions of the country um, that also fall behind as as others move forward when it comes to this. Um, and so certainly things like um, national broadband infrastructure and accelerating that um, is going to be very important for for rural parts of the country. Um, um, certainly looking at how uh, to encourage uh, commercialization within sectors that may have not necessarily historically adopted technologies at the same pace as others. Uh, things like that are going to be going to be very important going forward to ensure our economy remains competitive. Absolutely. Uh, so Linda, uh, you know, I think maybe I'll start, I'll, I'll, I'll throw this question over to you first and then I'll pass it over to Trevin. Um, you know, we've touched on this briefly, uh, but an estimated $340, $350 billion deficit is certainly nothing to scoff at. And we've already received uh, a handful of member questions about this issue. Um, so number one, how much of a consideration should the fiscal deficit be when we're discussing measures to, the, to support the recovery? And I'll merge a little bit of it with a, a member question. Uh, some of the members are asking, how best can governments reduce debt levels without sacrificing future competitiveness? Which I think is a fantastic question. Yeah, that is a great question. I guess we have a tiny bit of a save here, Francis, in that we have low interest rates yeah. and we will have low interest rates for the very foreseeable future. So that will give us a break on debt service. And that's a bit different from the times when we've had really high debt levels in the recent past, really good, in the decades that we can remember. And, you know, going back to history, as Trevin did also, um, post-war, we had high debt to pay back and we let growth do some of it. It would be great if that happens again. And I do think we will have a fairly brisk recovery out of this, as long as it doesn't take forever. There'll be a recessionary period, but there will also be companies doing well, and I, I believe we'll go back to growth, so that will help. Now, in terms of sacrificing competitiveness, I think we can go back to what we were doing before. I don't think we were doing enough for competitiveness at that time. I think there was a lot of red tape that could have been uh, gotten could have been erased and should be erased still. I think there was a lot of investments in technology and the like that weren't supported by government in the way that perhaps they could be. Uh, we know we've heard from business many times this competitive environment isn't what it should be. So I don't know that it's all money driven. It's partly money driven, but it's partly kind of a mindset. And maybe Canada needs to change the mindset coming out yeah. of this. Absolutely. Trevin, thoughts? 
Yeah, it's it's going to be a challenge for for Canada and for all countries. Um, and so I agree that getting back to growth um, is definitely going to be the the key to doing this. Um, you know, there are different ways to obviously get rid of debt. Uh, one of the big questions to me, and this relates to interest rates, um, is whether inflation will ever come back. Um, because that's that's a big question, right? Is that we have cheap money with low interest rates. We have a lot of government spending. We are, at least if the projections are correct, getting back to something like 5% growth in 2021, though that still won't even get us back to the point we were prior to the crisis. But the combination of high growth, um, cheap money and low interest rates um, and high government spending um, is a combination that should in theory produce inflation. Um, and if we do have inflation coming back at some point in the medium to longer term, um, then the Bank of Canada is going to be in between a rock and a hard place, depending on whether to raise interest rates and, and increase the debt burden on, on governments, on individual Canadians and on businesses, um, or to keep rates low and have inflation uh, you know, continue to rise and, and create other problems going forward. Um, and that's, you know, that's the whole big MMT, modern monetary theory argument that, that, that people are, are debating these days as well. Um, but, you know, I, I, and, you know, I think we would be wise not to forget the lessons of history, you know, stuff like this happened in the late 70s and 80s. Uh, you know, so um, it's quite possible that, that it could still happen again. Um, and so that's why to me, you know, I, I really think that, that we need to focus on growth, um, get back to competitive measures. Um, and that's, that's the key to help get us out of this. Absolutely. So uh, I just want to ask a couple more questions before we open it up to uh, to member Q and A's, uh, just to hit, you know make sure we're hitting enough kind of subject areas to spur thoughts among our members. Uh, Trevin, you discussed at length um, uh, the issue around kind of supply chains, uh, trade related infrastructure, or what have you. I, th I, I, I thought that was a really good way of framing it, mainly because it, it, is, it is perhaps a little bit more distinct in terms of how we're actually talking about infrastructure. A lot of what we talk about right now uh, is, number one, just infrastructure investment as a tool to spur growth because it's, it's relatively easy to do and it's a lever that governments are, are used to pulling in economic recoveries. But mainly it's talking about, uh, you know, leveraging that tool in support of Canada's shift towards a low carbon economy. Is this where government should be putting its focus in developing uh, its infrastructure strategy? So maybe I'll start with Trevin and open up to Linda afterwards. So I think something that 2008 taught us um, is that finding shovel ready projects are, it's a lot harder than you think. Um, you know, in theory, you, you should be able to, um, but to find a project that is, has gone through the regulatory process or is close to going through the regulatory process um, is, 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 is harder, um, cons also considering how onerous the regulatory process in Canada is compared to some other advanced industrialized companies to countries too. Um, but, you know, it, there are certain aspects that would really, really help uh, economic growth, uh, specifically trade enabling infrastructure. Uh, I think would be would be instrumental in, in getting back to economic recovery uh, and being able to, to put some of that in place. Certainly, you know, we, people have been talking about transit as well um, and, and considering uh, how much consumer confidence might have changed in public transport, that that might be a necessity too. Um, but infrastructure is, is one part of, of a larger conversation to get back to growth. I mean, infrastructure spending alone won't necessarily do it. Um, we need to focus on other aspects of our economy too. Um, but it's one, it's one tool that we can use, uh, you know, going forward, uh, keeping in mind the challenges that we'll face and actually finding those projects. Absolutely. Linda, your thoughts? Can you rephrase the question, Francis? I want to make sure I get your yeah, sure. here. Yeah. Sure. Uh, just in, in talking about infrastructure, you know, it's, it's typically a tool that governments are, are, can very easily pull to spur economic recoveries. Uh, but a lot of the conversation about where those dollars should go uh, is at least in part kind of helping spur this transition to a low carbon economy. So my question was, is this where government should put their focus in developing its infrastructure strategy? Yeah, it's, uh, it's a really good question because I think we have to sit down post-pandemic and say, well, really, what has changed? You know, even the idea of spending on infrastructure, I realize we have crumbling highways and everything else in parts of the country, but that was kind of spending that was about another economy. That's not a service economy. That's not a high-tech economy. It's a different one. And I think we need to question whether that's the best thing. Now, even on transit, what kind of transit are we going to need post-pandemic? Is... Is it really going to be what it was? Not just that people are going to work from home, but is work from home even going to be near cities if yeah. you can work anywhere? How much 
are we going to see city growth change? So I don't think we should rush into anything, even leaving the low carbon question alone. I think it's time for a real rethink of all of it. Yeah. Uh, so you know what? I think that that makes a great transition because a lot of our members are asking lots of questions about work from home. So uh, maybe I'll, I'll I'll pause here for for the moderated discussion. And before we move on to the to the answering members your questions, uh, maybe I'll ask our other moderator to throw up our second poll question. But hold on, Linda, because we're we're going to ask you lots about this um, for the longer term. What should be government's number one consideration to help guide the economic recovery? So uh, you guys can see the, the options again on your screen. So maybe again, I'll ask, um, maybe Trevin, uh, since we're gonna open with Linda on the, on the first member queue, maybe I'll ask you to start. What do you think the, the top priority should be? Uh, I think the top priority needs to be getting Canadians back to work. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, you know, this has huge repercussions, obviously for individual Canadians, uh, you know, this, this is a huge deal, but also in terms of, in terms of demand, uh, in terms of, of actually, you know, having our economy being able to run on all cylinders, um, you know, I, I think that that workforce piece is very important. Absolutely. Linda? I think these are all kind of long term things. They're all important, the low carbon economy and reskilling and the digital economy. But I think getting this moving more quickly is probably you know, putting in more business supports and perhaps helping them get more digital and more tech and everything else going. But yeah. uh, these are really long-term goals. Yeah, absolutely. So maybe we can close the poll and see what the results were. Modernizing the tax system. I mean, you know, our members are all in the tax. Many of our members are in the tax area. So perhaps not that. That's a, oh, sorry. It is reskilling. Sorry, I, I read that wrong. Reskilling and revised income supports for workers. My apologies. Uh, this is interesting. So uh, clearly there's a lot of focus here. So uh, Linda, I'm going to open maybe the first question to you. Um, there's, there's a lot of interesting questions here, but maybe I'll ask the first one here. Do you foresee a long-term adoption of work from home policies and what would the long-term impact of this be? I think the impacts could be extremely fundamental, but go, go where your, <laughs> tell us where your heart goes when you answer that question. Okay. I'm going to say yes. And it's not about my heart. It's just because it's cheaper. Um, if you don't need to pay the commercial rents in big cities, you have an advantage right there. We were already starting to see this before this happened. You know, some of the regions which were kind of ahead of the curve were kind of luring workers. Vermont said, is trying to get younger people in text and said, you know, you, you can live here all year. You don't have to just come to ski. We're going to give you $10,000 to set up an office here. You get paid by your company in California, and this is where you can live. Uh, I think we'll see lots more of this. Now, there are huge, huge things we don't understand uh, in terms of repercussions here. For one thing, work is a social support for many people. We're not really great at having you know, community things that we do. Uh, this is not the era of churches and bowling leagues, which we had 50, 60 years ago. So we have to kind of shift over if we're all going to work from home or some of us are going to work from home. Uh, it's probably better for people who are at different stages of their lives. I don't think you'd want to graduate right from university and go right back to your parents' bedroom or your, your parents' house or even your own apartment. It's pretty isolating. So, you know, those are all things we need to think about. Never mind the commercial real estate uh, implications here, which are gigantic. But I think it comes down to the fact that it doesn't necessarily make economic sense to have everybody in one room doing one thing. That was necessary at one point because the technology was there. You had to be in the factory, you had to be in the office, you didn't even have a computer or a typewriter at home. Now you can do it from your iPhone and you can't really turn back from that. Yeah, I, so I, I mean, one of the things that always kind of strikes me is like how many of the kind of economic policy conversations surround the notion of urbanization, like this increasing concentration of population within our urban cores, everything from tr public transit, like you already mentioned, like, will we still need the same kind of transit infrastructure post pandemic? It's a really open question. The trajectory for home prices and commercial real estate prices, um, all of these things are now up in the air if people no longer need to uh, need to work from that kind of center where that's become kind of this, you know, you know, ground zero for skilled workers and jobs and businesses. So Trevin, a, a follow-up question that one of our members asked, uh, once businesses truly internalize that remote working is possible, companies will be able to hire from anywhere in the world without immigration. What will the impact be for Canadian workers? 
Yeah, and that's a, that's a really important question going forward is whether there will be um, also restrictions put on place on workers from abroad working remotely too is, is an yeah. important question too as well. Um, I mean, so on remote work, I think there are a few aspects to keep in mind as well. <clears throat> Also, all sectors cannot necessarily have people working from home, right? Uh, there, you know, uh, there are certain sectors of our economy that almost require a physical presence. And actually, we're seeing some of those sectors that almost require physical presence for their business models to work being some of the hardest hit right now, too, right? Um, you know, when we're talking about food services and restaurants, um, you know, they, 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 need, they need to basically have, have physical presence and have people go to their establishments to actually have their business models work. Um, when we're talking about tourism. Uh, when we're talking about transportation for a large part, right? And, you know, these, when we're talking about construction, uh, though that can potentially be automated, but we're talking about, you know, these sectors together comprise a huge portion of our economy. So, you know, I am obviously in the service sector and I understand, you know, a number of members are in accounting too. Um, but I do think that there are a lot, a lot of workers that will not necessarily have the option of working from home. Um, and so, uh, you know, that almost creates a, a, a bit of a distinction uh, between different groups and who might be able to access workers from abroad and who, who might not. Um, but uh, what regulations are put in place, you know, I mentioned global fragmentation, obviously, yeah. um, and what we're looking at, you know, we're certainly looking at potentially more protectionist measures, certainly from yeah. some countries, we'll see what Canada ends up doing. Um, does that apply to labor as well? And does that apply to remote work will, will be an interesting question. Yeah, I think that's, that's a, a, a fantastic point. I think everything we discuss is now in this global context of increasing fragmentation and protectionism. So, you know, we can't put anything off the table anymore. Uh, so kind of, I, I want to jump all the way back to uh, this this notion of income supports, because I think, Trevin, you brought up a really, a really important point about who was impacted. I mentioned two of the three million jobs were low skilled, low wages, and they were in the ones you talked about, food, tourism, uh, recreation, etc. So it's, it's like there's a schism between the labor market, between jobs that required physical presence and, and, uh, and jobs that didn't, so largely, you know, people like myself. Um, so one of the, <laughs> so I'm, I'm just a really broad question, but a member did ask it, so I'm going to throw it out there. Linda, maybe I'll start with you. What do you think of universal basic income? You know what? Before this happened, I thought we couldn't afford it. Um, I looked at a bunch of numbers and said, I just don't see how this is going to happen. If we give everybody money every month, what do we have to give up? Do we have to give up every library and every playground and you know, all kinds of things just to pay this? Now, we've done it uh, for a few months with CERB, and I know some people want it to continue. I think we have to have that conversation, but I don't know if we can afford it now either. It's not something that could, could be done in perpetuity. What it has shown to us, though, is that there were many people who were better off with the income support than they were before. And as we get into a more fragmented economy, perhaps fewer jobs and more work, gig work, seasonal work and the like, uh, it will be something that people will want more and more. So I don't know that we can have it at the level that we have it, but I think there is going to be an argument to have some kind of money, maybe not 2000 a month, maybe 500 a month, and yeah. maybe heavily taxed for people who actually have jobs and will be making uh, fairly high incomes, but more on the, the lines of some of the child care's programs we've seen in the past where they're universal, but they're taxed, but they give some stability. Because long before this started, I thought you know, stability, instability was really going to be the, the issue we would have to contend with. I completely agree. I, I think one of the things that bothers me is often how we talk about universal basic income in this country, that we implemented the, the emergency response benefit, the CERB, and then people took that as if it was a universal basic income, but it's, it's nothing like a universal basic income, which is supposed to be, you know, condition free money. Um, so Trevin, I want to ask you your thoughts, because I, I think kind of you had an interesting perspective on this when you talked about the CERB kind of being this emergency support that ought to give way to more transitionary policies like the wage subsidy. So maybe I can get you, you can give your thoughts about whether or not you think uh, basic income is in our future or what do you think about the policy in general? So I think um, in theory, CERB shouldn't have even been necessary if the EI system was working properly. Um, and, you know, it didn't necessarily, like some of the groups that Linda talked about, didn't necessarily cover gig workers and some of the ways in which the economy is changing. Um, and so I think in this kind of in-between phase of reopening, 
Um, we need to, you know, have that ramping model for the wage subsidy. Um, at the same time, considering, you know, how to uh, get away from from CERB subsidies and get Canadians back to work, keeping in mind that all Canadians want to have a job to go back to. Um, and so, uh, in, in combination when these two things are taking place, we need to reform the EI system at the same time. Um, and that needs to include a very strong reskilling and upskilling component tied to EI. Um, you know, so that as Canadians that, that fall through the cracks that don't necessarily have the supports or don't have a job to go back to, they're able to get access to reskilling and retraining uh, programs um, that will then hopefully get them back into the workforce at a later point. Yeah, that's a great point. So uh, there's, there's, uh, you know what, I, I, I apologize for jumping around, but the, you know, there's so many branches to these discussions that I find really interesting. So I'm going to move on to a, another member question. And uh, Linda, perhaps we'll start with you. It's a very, I think this is a very pointed question, but it gives us a lot of opportunity to talk about this. I mentioned this notion of economic scarring, that the potential for businesses uh, due to kind of liquidity needs or financing needs and they don't get it, they might fall and those jobs and output will never come back. So the member's question was, given looming bankruptcies and the number of financially distressed entities, how can jobs and facilities or businesses be saved? Should governments set up war rooms um, and restructuring incentives to help save companies and anchor employment in Canada? Uh, what are your thoughts on this? Okay, this is going to come out perhaps wrong, but I don't think we can save jobs. I think we can save work. I think the notion of one job and security and one company was already going. And for a lot of people, it was going to be about assignments and coming together as part of a team to do one project and doing something else for a while. And that's true for some of the lower paid workers, but it's also true for some of the higher paid workers as well. We've seen that through tech and we've seen it um, for service industries more and more. And I, I think that's, something we had to get our minds around anyway. As to your question, like how are we gonna get people back to work and how are we gonna save some of this? Uh, it, it's a tough one. I think we have to be prepared to spend some more money and perhaps save the businesses that can be saved, but also realize that maybe we're gonna be creating different businesses and they're not gonna be the same ones. It's gonna be a very difficult call because are you throwing good money after bad? I mean, I look at some of the department stores that are closing, particularly in the US, but here as well, those couldn't be saved. And they were going to go down. The pandemic just took them down a little bit more quickly. Same with some restaurants. But at the same time, we have other restaurant models coming um, into play. We're seeing a model where you only have kitchens, not for takeout. Right. Ghost kitchens. Just, yeah, ghost kitchens, right? And they're using some of the department stores for that, right? And so, like, which, which are the things you're going to support? Yeah. It has, it's a, a hard thing to call. Agreed. Uh, so a, a follow-up question, because a lot of people have asked just general questions about education, skills, and reskilling. Uh, so maybe, Trevin, I'll ask you this question. And in fact, Ned, Linda, I, I might want to ask your, your, your thoughts on this, because it, you, you, know, you mentioned it about how do we fund uh, skills and reskilling and upskilling. You know, we've, we've had at least a little bit of time now with these government uh, individual training accounts. I'm wondering if you've had any perspective on, or Trevin, you as well, if either of you have any perspective on whether or not that particular funding model, that kind of cost sharing between uh, government and individual is actually the right one. So Trevin, so broad thoughts about what government should do to help prepare people for the labor market needs of the future and whether or not you have any perspective on, on the funding model that works. I, um, I, I think we need community solutions. Um, you know, I think that there are different skills that are in demand by different employers at the community level, and that varies by, by community to community. Um, and so what we're working on at the Canadian Chamber of Commerce is bringing together um, employer collaboratives within individual communities, you know, using local chambers of commerce to do that, and to figure out what skills are in demand across employers within communities. So then you can create talent pipelines by working together uh, with post-secondary institutions or other sorts of training programs to do that. Um, and certainly, you you know, there would definitely be an incentive for, for employers to, to be doing that because they'll get the skills that are tailored to, towards what they need. Um, and then it also creates this adaptive system, obviously, in the economy that we're in with skills needs changing so quickly um, to do that. And, you know, I, I really think that is, that is the way of the future. It's something that's been piloted in the U.S. Yeah. Um, in about 30 different states. And so we're, we're looking to bring that up to Canada. 
I find that really funny that so many of the issues that we're talking about, like Linda talked about precarious work and gig work, um, that what seems to be old is new again. Like you're talking about kind of collectives. Uh, a lot of people are talking about co-ops as a solution to like insurance needs or like, you know, income supports for, for precarious and gig workers. So it's almost, and this is, you know, this was common back in the 70s and the 80s. So it's almost like what's old is new again. Linda, uh, your thoughts about uh, how government should, could help prepare for the labor market needs of the future. You know what, I think it's important to have those conversations. I think educational institutions need to be part of this. I'd like to see companies doing a lot more retraining and bringing in educational institutes and governments and everything else. And I agree about the communities. It's extremely important. Having said that, we're talking about work not necessarily being community-based now. So mm -hmm. it's a much different conversation. It's not like the old days where you have a town, you're trying to bring in a factory and you hold a press conference and say, wow, we have 300 jobs here. It could be you have people who are sitting there and they're working for, um, for employers for a long way away. And we talked about, should Canadians be worried that you may have somebody in uh, a different country taking a job that was previously meant for a Canadian. You can also have a Canadian working for an American company or a British yeah. company or right. you know, an Asian company. So it's not necessarily just about communities. It's, it's a much broader conversation. Yeah. So uh, it may be, so this last one is a bit of a doozy. So I'll, I'll reserve our last five minutes of the session for this one. Uh, Trevin, I'm going to start with you and, and, and open it up to, to you, Linda. Does this tax system have a role to play in the recovery? A lot of our members have asked this question about what role it has to play. In the past, uh, Trevin, both the Canadian Chamber of Commerce uh, CP Canada and other organizations have called on government for a comprehensive tax review. Is now the time for something as bold as a full review or do you think there ought to be more targeted measures to support the recovery with the full review maybe being more of a longer term goal? What do you think? So, uh, I mean, a full tax review will take some time. So I understand that, you know, it, it can't necessarily be the solution that we look to by, by the end of this year, even because we, we just don't have time to, time to put together a review in that time. Um, what I think is very important is that over the longer term to get back to growth, this is going to be uh, a crucial aspect of it. You know, our tax system um, is, is not necessarily competitive compared to, to some of our uh, comparable countries that we look at. Um, and we are in this situation where we haven't done a comprehensive tax review in, in half a century, you know, since, since we haven't done a comprehensive tax review since the last time humankind locked on the moon since before that. Um, and, uh, and, and this is going to be very important going forward. I think what um, we need to keep in mind, and I know CPA did a great report on this early last year, um, is that there are a number of different ways to do a comprehensive tax review. Uh, you know, there are different models in New Zealand and Australia and the UK, um, and that it doesn't necessarily have to be government-led. Um, you know, like the Mirley's review in the UK was actually an independent review, somewhat funded right. by government, but still independent, and then government actually implemented those, those solutions. Um, and so I would, um, I would look for an announcement from the Canadian Chamber of Commerce maybe later this week um, uh, related to this. <laughs> we'll look up for that. And, and it's also worth noting New Zealand also went down the same model with expert panels and, and now the government's working through that as well. So there's been lots of, of progress in there and some really in interesting recommendations. Linda, what are your thoughts on, you know, obviously we'd love your thoughts on, on you know, the need for a comprehensive tax review, but any specific measures you think would help from a, from a tax perspective for businesses or anybody? You know, it's a really difficult thing to answer because we are coming into an environment where we both need to raise taxes to pay for all this, and we need to cut taxes to get growth going at the same time. And there's going to be some really interesting budgets that we see from provinces and nationally over the next few years. And I think that we didn't really get into this provincial finance issue, but we're going to have a lot of haves and have nots in this country, and we're going to be dealing with that for a long time. I'd be interested to see what federal transfers look like at the end of this. Uh, not an easy time to be setting policy for sure. In terms of whether this is time for a review, I think it is, not necessarily this year, as we've been saying, but over the next few years, because we're gonna have a completely different economy, really different in terms of how we work, different in terms of the businesses that are operating and everything else. I think a lot of the policies we have for taxes and everything else were set at a time when we had an economy that's not even there anymore, that wasn't there before the pandemic. So the more we can change now, the better. Yeah, absolutely. So we only have two minutes left. So 
perhaps I'll, I'll end it there just to be respectful of, of everyone's time. Uh, first off, I'd like to, to just extend a, a warm thanks to both of our, our panelists for providing some fantastic comments and being really uh, great about answering all of these questions that have really uh, kind of run the gamut of, of topics and uh, subject areas. So thank you both Trevin and Linda for participating today. Um, just as a note to our members and attendees, uh, we would have loved uh, to get to as many uh, of, your, of your questions as we could, but unfortunately with the number of people in attendance, uh, we're unfortunately gonna ask for your understanding that we, we uh, simply uh, weren't able to get everyone uh, get to everyone's questions in this session. That being said, if I can ask our moderator to go back to our, our slide presentation for, for a second. One last reminder that this conversation continues on our digital engagement platform. Uh, so you can register there where we have some questions available for you to discuss and uh, a form for you to post some ideas. Uh, a link uh, for that, you'll find one of our staff has actually typed into the Q&A box uh, if you scroll to the end. So please visit and contribute your thoughts if you haven't already. Uh, we truly value this dialogue with you and uh, we'd like to keep it going. Uh, so uh, with that, maybe I'll just extend one more thanks to our panelists and to you for attending. Uh, have a great day and uh, we'll see you at the next webinar. Thanks so much. Thanks guys. <laughs>